uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be asked to deliver a keynote in this uh, conference today. Um, and the idea of delivering a keynote is often quite, um, it's quite intimidating because the idea of a keynote suggests that I must be profound and thought provoking and engaging uh, and challenge all of you to think differently, think out of the box, um, which is quite a tall order. Um, so I've just decided, well, look, it was Women's Month when I had to prepare, so I've got to rise to the occasion and pose some challenging ideas for all of us to think about in these extraordinary times. And so my, the title of my talk today is really about challenging imagination poverty. And the focus is really on what I think is important is about making trauma-informed care, making that practical in a world that is constantly being referred to as a VUCA world, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And of course, in our context, it is also unequal and unjust. So calling it an UVUCA world is more appropriate. And a world that is also increasingly digital and digitized um, that really defines the context that we're in. And so in, in, in starting, I think it would be important to recognize and acknowledge the extraordinary times that we're living in. Uh, one of the most used words, if I had to do a word cloud of all the words that I've been using over the last two years, almost, um, heartfelt condolences would certainly stand out as uh, the words that have been most used in the way we talk to each other these days. I want to acknowledge the estimated more than 2,000 teachers that have already died due to COVID-related complications, um, and we know that there are many more. There are many more who've become ill. Um, and so we encouraged by the fact that the vaccination rollout has been um, largely successful and continue to encourage our teachers and our education officials to vaccinate in an attempt to try and also ensure that we can deliver and recover and rebuild our education system under these conditions. So heartfelt condolences to the families, friends, uh, colleagues, comrades, in the teaching profession, the teachers are our frontline workers, and I thought it is quite an important moment to pause and reflect and acknowledge those teachers who have passed on. So the perspective I'm going to be coming from largely in this talk is the big picture system wide perspective, and I recognize that each of us as individual actors are located very deeply within our national education system in South Africa. We're part of a, a regional education system and a global education and training system. And that as individual actors, we work on projects and programs in institutions, but we are integrally tied in all that we do to this bigger system. And, and so making the connection between what we do concretely and how that relates to the bigger world, the bigger picture, um, and making the connection between the concrete, the practical, and the increasingly abstract is quite important. And so I often use the analogy of being the eagle, having an eagle bird eye view of the entire system when we talk about the kinds of challenges that are confronting us, but also recognize that many of us are also in the field uh, we have boots on the ground and that we are also moles um, on the ground and making that connection is going to be quite important in, in, in moments of reflection about what is actually happening and how do we behave as actors in the education system. And in doing so, wanting to just leverage the, the interrelationship between theory, policy and practice where many of us attending this conference are also located. So I thought it's quite important to just frame uh, the approach that I'm adopting uh, today um, and invite 
uh, a conversation, a, a revisitation and a reflection on how we are located in this bigger system. So all of us know that March 2020, we often talk about pre-1994, 1994, and now increasingly the big rupture is March 2020. Um, and the COVID context has become our new world, um, a critical reference point about how we also frame what is happening in the world. And often there are references to deep-seated challenges that have surfaced in the face of the COVID rupture. I think that at the heart of what we are experiencing as a nation, as a system, uh, globally and in South Africa and in the African continent is at the heart of it is a system that is traumatized, that is experiencing toxic stress and it manifests in the many different uh, stimuli and uh, feedback that we are getting based on all the research that has been happening over the last year. And I'm not going to go into all of those details. Many of us in this forum know them very well. We know the statistics on child hunger and how that has increased under COVID. We also know very alarmingly that what is sometimes referred to as rising school dropouts, I want to refer rather to calling it pushouts. These are learners and children and young people are being pushed out of the system and that that figure has risen quite alarmingly uh, in comparison to pre-COVID um, times that we are envisaging and, and it, it is so illuminating to see the depth of the inequality within the learning space in terms of loss of livelihood and loss of curriculum learning in terms of what is currently being measured. But we know that beneath that sits a whole host of other forms of trauma uh, that manifest uh, as we know it as, as learning loss. Uh, the rising mental health crisis that is upon us um, has been referred to often. Um, and I think last week or two weeks ago, the shocking statistics around uh, the prevalence of uh, teenage pregnancies that emerged during the COVID period, I was even more shocked at a UN report that talked about 150,000 teenage pregnancies in 2020 alone in, in a country like Kenya. Um, and then, of course, we are also very aware of the extent of digital inequality, whether we use the narrow definition or the more broader societal definition, and how that manifests in the form of higher data costs, even though with, we've had lower data bundles on offer, um, but infrastructurally, uh, there's significant uh, inequality that also militates against uh, access to resources that are digital to many of our learners and teachers. And together, in combination, I think that we need to frame what we do in the context of what is really a deepening uh, societal trauma and toxic stress. And that is really the focus of my discussion today, that that actually frames what we do and how we approach uh, what we need to be doing in, in education. And as colleagues have already indicated to me in a brief conversation before this talk uh, with some of the uh, Latasa organizers, we were talking about how an added layers of complexity um, has been brought about by the destruction um, and uh, the violence that we've experienced in provinces like KZN and Gauteng, and I wanted to call that out because this conference is actually happening in uh, the province that has been most deeply affected. I think the figure of 130 schools that were burned in July 2021 um, in both Gauteng and, and, and KZN um, has really captured the imagination in terms of the destruction, uh, the pictures of looting um, and riots. Um, uh, and we know that uh, what the effects of these events have had, um, we've only barely scratched the surface in trying to understand what the effects are. Uh, the South African Society of Psychiatrists have declared 
that what we have experienced in KZN and Gauteng can in fact cause post-traumatic stress disorder amongst the children and adolescents who were um, at the coal face of these events. Um, and that just adds more layers to the Uvuka world um, that many of us have been referring to. Um, and so what this has done collectively, I think, not just for myself as an important actor in the system, along with many of you, we've all asked ourselves, how did we get here? What did we do wrong? It is a quite a critical moment of reflection, of very deep reflection that we are, that has been imposed upon us as individual actors, but also as a collective. There are deep questions that we need to be asking ourselves around how is it that uh, there was so much hope in 1994 um, with the onset of our new democracy and that two and a half, more than two and a half decades later, um, there's just such destruction and mayhem. Um, and I think what it means when we have these moments of reflection is that we need to do a, a very serious re-examination as Paulo Freire has called upon. Um, I, I found this uh, quote very useful, that those who are authentically committed uh, to the people must really re-examine themselves constantly. And I do think that these are the moments for this kind of deep re-examination of ourselves as a collective, um, as well as ourselves as individuals. And I think at the heart of it, it means that we need to surface the uncomfortable conversations as well. I think that there's been new uh, research that is calling upon us to look at the moments where we may have been complicit by being silent, by not speaking out. That perhaps we have over the last two decades and more been trained into a certain kind of blindness, that we are not surfacing some of the rawness of the challenges that our learners and our teachers are experiencing in provinces like KZN, that there's a deafness, a denialism, an avoidance and awkwardness, um, levels of ignorance and reluctance. Often this demands of us that we bring the elephant in the room. And I think I, I thought that this was also useful to, in addition to bringing the elephant in the room, it's also about bringing the human in the room with the elephant uh, in order to talk about where has how humanity gone? Because at the heart of the trauma that we're experiencing is a profound dehumanization as well. Um, and so all of us, whether we're talking about what does this mean for literacy learning and teaching, um, this conversation becomes quite important because it has implications for how we do literacy, how we do literacy learning, how we do learning, um, curriculum learning, um, in our education system. So one of the tools I thought in this bringing the elephant in the room conversation that we need to have, the uncomfortable conversation, there's a technique that is often used in the business world called a critical incident technique. Um, but it's also been used widely in people, you know, in systems where people apply systems thinking. And it's critical, not in a negative sense, uh, that we are trying to find fault, but critical in terms of transitioning from one moment to another um, in a meaningful way. And um, it is a technique that invites us to just pause and consider specific moments of reflection uh, where something has struck us about how we acted and that allows us the tools to ask certain questions about how we behaved. And I thought that it would be useful to just surface this technique um, because for me, it has helped my reflection process as well in terms of where was I? What was I thinking? What did I do um, in terms of being potentially complicit? And where were the moments where I did shift the system towards something that makes our world more peaceful, more humane, 
more equal? What are those critical incidents? And in, in applying this technique, I thought I had two stories, but because of time, I'm only going to relate one of it. And the one story relates to what I call, I was part of um, a game with a number of my, my friends and we were doing this three minute story, three, sorry, three word stories. And my three word incident is called a capitulating moment. And the story goes like this, that I was asked to give insights and guidance on how do we roll out digital technologies to uh, our schools, um, particularly our Quintal 1, 2, and 3 schools in a South African context. Um, and it dovetails with a similar conversation uh, in, in Ethiopia and Rwanda, where I've also worked where similar questions were posed to me. So, so the donor uh, was interested in supporting a pilot study that would look at a few schools. And when choosing the schools, I recommended that in order for us to understand how these things work in terms of integrating technologies in learning and teaching, we've got to do this in the most under-resourced communities because that will allow us to understand, given the large number of under-resourced schools in our, um, in our country, um, it will allow us to understand how that could play out at scale. But then the moment came when we had to choose the schools, we realized um, a lot of the, uh, the other stakeholders felt that we couldn't go to the schools where the infrastructure was poor. We had to go and to rather to schools where there was basic electricity, there were buildings, um, there was running water. Um, and right there, I agreed with them reluctantly that we should be choosing schools that have better infrastructure. But the reality for me was the moment for me felt like I was capitulating because we were then going to reinforce going to better equipped schools, better resource schools, and thereby again, neglecting the schools that are under-resourced, especially in the context of engaging with digital inequality. And I define that for me as a capitulating moment. It's a moment where I capitulated when actually I felt very strongly and very deeply that our emphasis has to be on the most under-resourced schools, where the infrastructural challenges are manifest, that those are the spaces where we need to be prioritizing. And it made me reflect on what it means to capitulate. Um, you know, that it does mean to surrender, to yield, to submit. <clears throat> and if, you know, someone like me who loves playing with words, if we look at what the opposite of that meant was to fight, to resist, to pose the alternative, um, but I did not do that. And, you know, I just, it made me realize um, in applying the critical incident technique, I wrote out what happened, um, uh, what was good or bad about that experience, what sense can I make of the situation, what else could I have said or done, uh, and should that arise again, what would I do? Um, and the reason why that frame of reference is so important, because these critical incidents, and I'm sure all of us have many critical moments where we were complicit or where we capitulated. We also have moments where we shifted and moved the dial. And that these critical incidents collectively, they reveal they are micro enactments of a larger system of relations and interactions. And I think that for me, I know that there are many, many more moments of capitulation, of being complicit in potentially reinforcing inequality than there are moments of shifting the dial um, towards a system that's more humane and, and more just and more equal. And so this is an invitation then for all of us to perhaps reflect on where were those moments in our respective ecosystems? When did they arise? 
because I do think that in my own reflection of how did we get here, I think a, a bigger question also is how I and the ecosystems I've been in have been complicit in getting us to this place as well, is also a conversation that we need to have. And so questions around our noble emancipatory intent, all of us are inspired and motivated by either rights-based or social justice intent that informs what we do in the literacy space, in the education space, and that that really drives, many of us, it drives our passion. But at the same time, that dovetails also with certain practices that have become manifest and dominant in the way we do our educational practice, that it is very performative, often very technicist. There are very many territorializing behaviors. We work in silos. There are competitive practices. If we work with one donor, the donor doesn't want to work us to work with a competing donor. Uh, NGOs compete with one another. Uh, we compete for pots of money. Um, and that that has also become a dominant culture in the way we do our education practice. And it reinforces, it reinforces potentially the structures of invisibility and marginalization, exclusion and vulnerability. And so this is an invitation for us to have that conversation because I think that it is part of answering the question, how did we get here? And how have we been potentially complicit in getting us to this space? And I think this is the conversation that my invitation is that we need to be having uh, amongst ourselves. Many have been referring to these moments as a reflection of a poverty of imagination, that because of the continuing prevalence of oppression, Oppression is a word we often use in the 1980s. Oppression and exploitation, the people who are oppressed and exploited and marginalized. So the continuing forms of oppression that we are experiencing still and a deepening form of oppression is a reflection of a collective failure of our imagination. Um, and a number of people have referred to it as the poverty of our imagination. Um, Ashil Mbembe in a recent talk made reference to a, an African philosopher who hails from uh, Cameroon, who's based at the, at the University of Witwatersrand, um, referred to it as a poverty of imagination. And, um, and so again, with me playing with words, uh, having this lack of an imagination that is informed by a world that is more humane, uh, speaks to a sterility, a dullness, uh, an uncreativeness, um, a lack of creativity, uh, a flatness. Uh, I think that those are manifestations of uh, this, this big concept, this abstract concept referred to as a poverty of imagination. And so the question then arises as to how can we individually in our ecosystems, in the projects and programs and institutions where we are located, how do we challenge this ingrained, almost systemic poverty of imagination that is manifest in the kinds of uh, events that we have seen over the last uh, almost two years, and particularly over the last few months in South Africa. And I was inspired by, because we're now looking at different kinds of frames and frameworks that could guide the way we work because we cannot do business as usual. We need to find tools to engage with the discomfort, with the uncomfortable conversations. And I, I found that Sarah Molitani Hinkerman in her book uh, that she published in 2018, uh, which was entitled Disrupting Denial, she provided a framework that invites us to, to look at our context and reframe our context, to look at uh, the conceptual underpinnings of our work, to revisit how all of us have actually been trained uh, and the way we are thinking in our thinking frames and the training that we have um, undergone 
uh, perhaps since 94, um, and adopted a certain discourse and language uh, that needs to be revisited, as well as our practice uh, individually and collectively. Um, and I thought that, that framework is quite a useful um, thinking frame for us to consider when we, uh, when we have our moments of reflection uh, for which this talk is an invitation. Many of us know that, and we have read so many papers, uh, every time you go onto Google and you, and you, and you uh, search for COVID and education, the word reimagination crops up. Everybody's talking about reimagining education, uh, references to pivot and resetting and rethinking and re-engineering and leapfrogging the new normal, uh, that COVID was a wake-up call, that it was a rupture. Very lofty words. Um, but the poverty of the imagination to reimagine um, sits with being concrete as to what exactly does that mean in terms of how we behave differently, talk differently, do differently. And I think that it does invite us to look at this iceberg, to not just respond to what is visible uh, above the surface, uh, the behaviors and the artifacts, um, that which is explicit and conscious, but it is an invitation to look beneath the surface to look at our attitudes, our beliefs, and ask the question why, the uncomfortable question why, and engage with the uncomfortable answers that, that arise in an attempt to try and disrupt what we think is potentially uh, contributory factors towards um, the situation that we are currently finding ourselves in. And so a lot of the new literature that's coming out is, is a, an invitation to us to disrupt imagination poverty in our practice. And what that means is, uh, and I'm referring here to a recent book that came out by um, uh, Habiba Badrun and Desiree Lewis. Um, uh, and it's entitled, What It Means to be Black and Feminist in South Africa. Um, and they talk about the need to make the invisible visible, to have the tough conversations, to confront the discomfort, to break the silences. Oma Toso, one of the authors in that book, talks about the need for a politicized, a differently politicized imagination. And I found it very interesting that what we need to be engaging with is conversations about how we unmake what has been destructive and dehumanizing, how we remake and reclaim that which can make our world a lot more human. Um, and, and that too was their invitation uh, to all of us in terms of finding the tools to do that. And I think that the, the literature, and I've raised this before in a previous talk about that what we need to center uh, in, the, in our education work, in our literacy work, um, there are increasingly louder calls for us to center our work around a pedagogy of care. And it is about a philosophy that is based on a societal and individual and institutional commitment to centering care um, and I would argue trauma-informed care given the depth of the experience of trauma in our world, that that needs to become far more central in the way we do literacy, in the way we do um, learning and design learning, uh, the instructional design of our learning programs um, and so on. The pedagogy of care is also um, Joan Tronto. I found her definition as that which is a species activity that includes everything that we do to maintain, continue, and repair our world so that we may live in it as well as possible, including our bodies, ourselves, and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. Um, and so uh, I think that in addition to this broad framework around um, a pedagogy of care, we need to be centering a trauma-informed care and connection in our education practice. Um, 
uh, if we then look at, there's a lot of literature that's emerging now that is seriously looking at trauma and learning. I found some interesting papers, not in a South African context, and, and this is an invitation for all of us as well, is, is looking at trauma-informed literacy learning. Um, and I, I, I found one paper um, this morning, early this morning, um, in an American context. Um, but by many definitions, trauma is referred to as an exceptional experience in which powerful and dangerous events overwhelm a person's capacity to cope. We know, however, that in a South African context, the experience isn't always exceptional. That for many of the learners in our classrooms and for many of our teachers who are teaching the learners in our classrooms, the experience is actually a day-to-day -day experience. Um, it's not exceptional. And so we're learning more and more about this, almost this laminated, cemented, uh, traumatic lives that our learners and our teachers and our communities are, are leading. Um, and it is that which is not only visible, um, but it also manifests invisibly. And it manifests and we hear the invisibility when we just listen carefully to the stories that the children are telling about um, life at home, life under lockdown, many, many learners are still in the rotation school system. So when they have to stay at home and learn, when they come to school, um, so surfacing the invisible forms of trauma or understanding how that works and also recognizing that it's not only singular, it's not a singular experience, but that many of our communities in the education system in South Africa and in Africa and the rest of the world they're also multiply traumatized. Um, and that it is also, there's a lot more literature coming out about how the trauma is also embodied, it manifests in the body. And also that it's trans-historical um, and that it is manifesting in the body um, based on generations of experiences of trauma in various forms over time. Um, and that, I think that when we think about trauma-informed learning and teaching and a pedagogy of care, that we need to be considering all these facets and dimensions of trauma um, as well. And I think that the work that the, the Center on the Developing Child um, has been doing over the last few years around this idea of epigenetics, how the experiences of previous generations can affect who we are and what we do um, is an emerging uh, concept and, and science that is well worth our effort to, to just engage with. Um, and it challenges the, the debate or the binary debate around nature versus nurture. Um, and in fact, looks at how it is a combination of um, that which is genetically inherited and also that which is socialized um, and how that manifests in the way our brains function and our, um, our nervous system functions. Uh, and I think that that is a, um, uh, a, a very a fascinating um, uh, emerging science that, uh, that we need to be engaging with when we consider how we, um, how we design our interventions. So, I think linked to the idea of epigenetics um, that, uh, you, that the Center for the Developing Child has been engaged with is also the, the work and the research that, it, that they are uncovering around toxic stress um, and how toxic stress impacts brain architecture. Um, lots of work around adverse childhood experiences and how that affects learning adversely. Um, and uh, the, the understanding of brain science and how the influence of toxic stress on how the brain functions um, is, is also a fascinating emerging field of knowledge that we need to be engaging with in order to reframe um, our interventions in, in, in this space. More recently, this notion of Maslow before Bloom, 
has been the school slogan. Uh, we love snow slogans in South Africa, you know, we raise our slogans with our fists, but this is now a new Maslow before Bloom slogan that has also emerged, which is also raised in the context uh, of that we cannot talk about learning, uh, drawing on uh, Bloom's taxonomy, uh, the, the, the work uh, of uh, Benjamin Bloom, uh, which many of us are familiar with. We cannot engage with learning um, and um, higher progression, progressions of um, uh, learning complexity without taking into account some of the basic fundamentals uh, that uh, is, is, is explained in Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs, uh, which speaks to the importance of uh, ensuring that we create the most basic environments, we establish the most basic and respond to the most basic needs first in order to be able to allow uh, um, an environment where learning can happen. So children need to feel safe. They need to uh, feel sheltered. Uh, they need to eat uh, before they can, in fact, engage with learning. Um, and of course, in a digital world, uh, people have also argued that we also we basically a basic need is Wi-Fi and and battery. And and for those of us living in South Africa, we know that battery and 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 uh, access to electrical electricity infrastructure is actually a basic need as well. Um, but this slogan around Maslow before Bloom is gaining currency in the context also of surfacing the need for us to address the pedagogy of care um, and centering that in our uh, in our in the the way we design our learning interventions. Um, in fact, the National Department of Basic Education does have a framework. Uh, around care and support for teaching and learning. And I think that we need to retrain ourselves in understanding how this integrated model of care and support is, is now increasingly becoming fundamental. Um, and what I found useful about this framework is how it centers the child um, within the system. Um, the system of support around the child, in the family, in the school, in the community. Um, the infrastructural needs that the child um, uh, needs to be able to, to be cared for. Um, and I think it's a model for a more humane education system if we look very carefully at the different appendages to the, um, to the framework. So this is also how the issue around centering a trauma-informed practice um, has been raised in the national system by recognizing that we need to center CSTL in the work that we do as well. Um, and so what I thought would be useful is a lot of these ideas are seemingly abstract. What does it look like in practice? Um, and I thought I would just draw on very briefly two case studies. The one um, case study is an, uh, an institution that is based in the Western Cape called the Chrysalis Academy. And the model of a holistic healing-centered trauma-informed approach um, to their education practice. Um, and it's been spearheaded by the work of Dr. Lucille Mayer, who's currently also the CEO. She's a yoga practitioner. Uh, she's a, um, a, what they call a tray practitioner as well, which stands for trauma release exercise practitioner. Um, and the way that's been applied to um, many of the youth who are attending this, uh, this academy. And basically it's an academy that's targeted at young people between the ages of 18 to 25, with a strong focus on um, a program that will in allow them to connect with themselves, connect with the environment connect with nature, discover their potential, learn, grow, flourish, um, and also develop uh, and grow as community role models uh, so that they can build the ecosystems in which uh, they are located. So it's a three month residential program. They are then placed in jobs for one year and there's continued support that is provided uh, to them over a five year period. 
and a lot of the training is related to integrating um, practices around uh, trauma release, um, yoga, um, uh, doing yoga, connecting with nature, um, also learning to work with the hands, vocational skills. And I think that it offers a model that should in fact be replicated uh, across the country in terms of how we do trauma-informed learning um, and education practice. Um, so I thought that that was quite an important um, model to, to raise in this forum. Another is one in which I was, I've been centrally involved. Um, and this was a program, a remote and digital learning program that is um, responding, that was set up to respond to the COVID crisis, um, particularly under lockdown. So the National Education Collaboration Trust and the Department of Basic Education spearheaded um, two programs as part of a remote and digital learning program or campaign. It was a matrix, which is targeted at second chance matric learners and, and learners who are in matric, as well as Twele Pele, which is focused on learners from grade R to grade 11. And the focus was actually to provide supplementary support to the system to ensure learning continuity. Um, but wh why, what I wanted to raise about this intervention is less about uh, the remote and digital learning aspects. Um, and I can always uh, refer you to reports and the websites that will provide a lot more detail. For me, what was interesting is how we tried to integrate CSTL. We call it CSTL on RDL or CSTL beneath RDL as, as, as supporting the RDL that we work. And here the partnership that we, um, that we um, forged with the South African Depression and Anxiety Group is quite telling in terms of our attempt to integrate CSTL in RDL. So the program, um, the map of the program in terms of what we were uh, uh, planning to do over the last year and a half, um, around integrating and making available resources on many, many platforms from community radio stations to print media to uh, free to air television, making a wide range of resources available to the system, to teachers, to parents, to learners um, at all levels of the system um, at, on every conceivable platform, uh, particularly non-digital platforms given the, the, the prevalence of uh, digital inequality. But what we did was we discovered that there's a wealth of resources around how to manage anxiety, what to do when you're feeling depressed, how to engage with suicide ideation, which is increasingly prevalent amongst our young people. And so what we've basically done is made that available and, and had uh, embarked on a massive campaign uh, to let people know that these resources are available. Um, but this for us is a starting point. It cannot be the only thing because it's still very much, in my view, very much still supply side. It's making resources available. It's a very resource-based model um, and that we need to do a lot more work, a lot better thinking, um, be a lot more imaginative about how we ensure that it's integrated in the daily practice of learning and teaching in terms of how these resources are actually utilized and refined uh, that can speak more irrevocably to the, to the specific context of the learners that, that, uh, and the way they're experiencing multiple traumas in the way we've um, raised before. Um, so, so this idea of centering the child, not just as a passive recipient, but as a transformative agent um, in the learning process and in the engagement of um, a trauma-informed practice is what we are striving towards, what we still lack. And this is the conversation all of us need to have is how to do this better. What are the tools that we use to ensure that we can in fact integrate it in the daily practice of our teachers, of our parents, um, and we supply our learners with the tools to engage with, um, with the traumas that they are experiencing. Um, and so, I think I am hoping that I could leave all of us with the questions around, so what? Now that we have a sense that our work needs to be a lot more trauma-informed, what does it mean in terms of what we do, how we do it, 
What do we do next? I think we need to, in applying the Hinkerman model, is an important conversation in our context is to understand who and how is hit the hardest. Um, because there are layers and layers of people who are very are hit very hard and we need to understand who those are and focus attention on those who are hit the hardest those who are most excluded marginalized who are experiencing the invisible trauma the most um, and we need to have conversations as to who those are and how do we work better to engage in those spaces that we need to revisit our conceptual apparatus that informs the way we think um, and expand that and challenge our in collective imagination poverty um, and in search of better tools uh, that can make our world a lot more humane. We need to revisit the way all of us have been trained into this dominant discourse that is so performative um, and look at how we retrain, remake, revisit um, ourselves as practitioners, as thinkers, as doers in the system. And then look at how we learn and unlearn and make and remake in, in, our, in our daily practice as well, in terms of how we integrate a trauma-informed care and support approach in the education practice uh, that all of us are currently engaged in. And so I thought that the work of um, Brene Brown, uh, where she talks about daring greatly, um, being a daring leader, uh, that requires brave work, it requires tough conversations and whole hearts. Um, it's in her book, uh, Dare to Lead. I thought I'd leave all of us with some very interesting books that have emerged. Some of it um, have been re republished. Uh, and we need to ask ourselves, what should we be reading? I think this is part of the reading list in terms of what all of us should be reading. And since this is about, uh, this is a literacy conference we should be talking about, uh, what we should be reading. Um, and then to conclude on the note that uh, I thought the Zen saying is very poignant and apt uh, in terms of resurfacing um, a richer imagination that challenges imagination poverty. And it says that it is in the silence between the notes that make the music. It is the space between the bars that cages the tiger. We've been focusing mainly on the bars. The invitation of this talk is for us collectively to engage with the spaces between the bars because therein lies the disruption and our need to engage with that which makes us all uncomfortable and we need to surface that. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for this, uh, for this opportunity to, to speak to you. Thank you very much, Ngia Bonga. Danke, Kia Le Boha. Okay, I don't, I think, and here I've also left some references to uh, some of the work that I've been referring to um, as well. Thank you very much.